let me say good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. And as uh, Ian would have indicated, we were delayed by just a bit of a technical difficulty. But um, this is a sports program. So if we are fit, we should be able to catch up um, on any hurdles that we may have stumbled on um, on our way uh, to getting started. Thank you so much for your support uh, for the program that has been happening. And um, I know this is the fourth installment and uh, we're really, really happy uh, to be able to spend this time uh, together. Let me begin by introducing the distinguished panel. And uh, I really do want to thank uh, Dr. Ali for bringing some balance because uh, um, if you would have seen the flyer, there are a couple of lawyers. I'm not gonna say anything about what I do, but uh, <laughs> there are a couple of lawyers there. So we really needed to have some balance. So we have Dr. Ali uh, with us, Dr. Terry Ali currently serves as the chairman of the First Citizens Sports Foundation. He is also a vice president of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee, as well as uh, the chairman of the Anti-Doping Committee and Internal Committee of the TTOC. There's Christoph Braffitt, sports lawyer, and Christoph would have done his uh, master's degree in sports law at the De Montfort University in Leicester. Uh, Christoph has really distinguished himself in sports law and other areas of legal practice. And uh, Christoph has published both locally and uh, internationally. Christoph brings a lot of experience uh, from a sports legal perspective, and we're very, very excited to have him on the panel. Last but not least, we have uh, Mr. Jaime Lamboy. Uh, he's an attorney at law from Puerto Rico, fluent in both English and Spanish. And uh, Jaime has really uh, served the, the region very well, um, as well as the international sporting community. Jaime currently sits as the president of the legal commission of the International Volleyball Federation. That's the FIVB. This is the world governing body for volleyball. So those who are familiar with football, they would know FIFA runs uh, football uh, globally. The FIVB runs volleyball globally, and he is the president of the legal commission. And he also has served uh, um, on the legal commission of NORSECA. Uh, NORSECA is the North Central American and Caribbean Volleyball Association comprising over 40 member federations. So ladies and gentlemen, we have a, a, a really distinguished, a really experienced panel. And uh, tonight's discussion is sports law and uh, drugs uh, in sport. Now we promise uh, with so many lawyers um, on, on, on this particular uh, panel, we are not going to bog you down with lots of uh, legal and technical um, terminology. We're gonna try and keep it as uh, down to earth and everyday as possible, all right? Um, and we're gonna have a really, really interesting discussion of course, as we draw closer to the end of the panel discussion, we welcome your questions and comments. And uh, we will have uh, Mr. Hema Cox, uh, who will be the one moderating um, uh, the chat, uh, the live chat on YouTube to let us know exactly what types of questions are coming in. So I wanna follow in the footsteps of my good friend, uh, Mushtaq Mohammed, who a couple uh, seminars ago, uh, introduced the discussion uh, with a brief, uh, PowerPoint presentation. So please follow with me as I share uh, just a few slides that would really set the tone um, for the panel discussion and hopefully it would generate uh, some questions uh, from you, our um, listening and viewing audience. If we look on, on the the first slide, it's entitled The Whereabouts Problem. And you see the name here, Coleman. Uh, this is Christian Coleman, and you would see Coleman there dipping uh, to the line ahead of Usain Bolt. That's not an accident. This would have been back in 2017 when uh, Usain Bolt would have been running his final competitive event. And uh, Christian Coleman really shot to global prominence because he beat Bolt twice. Um, it was not a fluke when he beat Bolt uh, in the semifinals. Uh, he went on to beat him again 
uh, in the final. Now, of course, a certain Justin Gatlin had a different, um, uh, he, you know, he just kind of threw the, the, the whole, uh, we threw a, a spoke in the wheel because Justin Gatlin came and actually beat both of them. Coleman was second and Bolt was third. But what's the context of this? Christian Coleman recently, all right, has been, um, I believe, provisionally suspended because of a whereabouts failure. That is, in, in, in the period of 12 months, a 12-month window, all right, he has not been where he's supposed to be for the purposes of uh, um, a sample collection and drug testing. And that has become one of the mechanisms within the, the global anti-doping regulatory community uh, to really ensure that athletes can be um, tested uh, out of competition without advance notice. And so because of this uh, three uh, missed tests in the period of 12 months, um, we have a situation where Coleman uh, may very well be suspended depending on how um, proceedings go forward from taking part in the Tokyo Olympic Games. We have two Caribbean athletes who had similar challenges. Trinidad and Tobago's own Michelle Ahi, Commonwealth gold medalist in the Gold Coast in 2018, and one of the leading uh, T20 cricketers, Andre Russell. Russell's problem was that he did not update his whereabouts information. In other words, when you are an elite level athlete, you really are supposed to be available 365 days a, day, a year. So when the doping control officers come to test you, they should be able to find you. And so you are actually required to, to give a, a 60 minute window where you can be found. And Andre Russell did not make his information. Um, it was not accurate, it was not updated. So there were occasions where they may have wanted to find him and they could not. And as a result of this, Andre Russell served a one year ban. Michelle Lee, uh, he's similar to Christian Coleman. Three particular occasions in a 12 month window, um, they showed up to be able to, to test her. And whether it was calling the telephone and knocking on the door, ringing the doorbell, um, she was not available. And uh, she is currently now serving a two year suspension. This has been appealed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport by the TTOC, the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee. We have two relay teams here, the Jamaica relay team from Beijing 2008, the Trinidad and Tobago relay team from Beijing 2008. This is first and second. But you know, as a result of the retesting of the sample of Nesta Carter, all right, this is the one in the picture next to Asafa Powell, in between Asafa Powell and Usain Bolt. Eight years after the Beijing Olympic Games, they retested his sample and there was a positive test for MHA, something that um, Dr. Ali will tell us about in a short while. And the Jamaica team was actually disqualified. Trinidad and Tobago, nobody really wants to benefit, especially from the loss of a Caribbean neighbor, but Trinidad and Tobago would have been elevated, all right, to the gold medal as a result of uh, that positive test. So one person tested positive for Jamaica, the whole team is disqualified. Is that really fair? Uh, that's something I'd want to throw out, especially to Jaime and to Christoph. And maybe you have your own thoughts as to whether or not one person testing positive. You know, should the other teammates, all right, whether, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a relay or something like that, should they be able to keep their medals when one person tests positive? You may have your own view on it. Kellyanne Batiste suffered, um, uh, had to undergo a 21-month 20 um, period of ineligibility. And um, it, it, under the, the anti-doping anti -doping court at that point in time, it should have been two years, but she provided some assistance, all right, um, to the anti-doping authorities, which probably could have helped to unearth, uh, you know, some um, anti-doping activity or some doping activity behind the scenes. Um, she didn't really benefit a lot from providing that assistance. It's a bit of encouraging, uh, you know, whistleblowing. Uh, the person, the other person on the screen, Tyson Gay, provided the same assistance and he or only had to undergo a one-year ban. Uh, so there were some question marks when Kellyanne Batiste got 21 months and uh, Tyson Gay got only 12. There were some questions within the Caribbean, well, where's the equilibrium if it's the same factual circumstances before the table? So again, people have the question marks, okay, is there differential treatment you know, between the developed nations and the, um, the developing nations? People had their own thoughts on it. Again, is the, is the playing field really level? Um, when it comes even to sanctioning, you may have your own view uh, on it. The document that you're seeing on the screen, the anti-doping code, this is a document that really governs um, 
the whole anti-doping movement and the 2015 code is currently in force, um, not for much longer on the 1st of January next year, the 2021 code is going to take effect. I, I wrap up this little introduction by bringing to your attention, and many of you may have followed the very, very interesting cases. One sprinter from India, this is Duty Chand, and the South African middle distance runner, Casta Semenya. We're going to talk about the Semenya decision a little bit later on. And for those who may not be familiar, pretty much the track and field world governing body, the IAAF, have said, look, Semenya, because of the high levels of testosterone uh, in your system, you are biologically male. So even though you are recognized legally as a female and you have identified yourself as female, according to your testosterone levels, you are biologically male. So if you're going to have a level playing field and you're going to compete with women, you must take medication to suppress your levels of testosterone. That matter has been appealed. I'd love to hear Dr. Ali's view um, on this, you know, the, the, the whole idea of a woman having to take um, medication to suppress, um, you know, something that is produced endogenously. And, and so there's a bit of, a, of a, a dilemma here because on one hand, WADA says don't take drugs. And then on the other hand, you have an international federation say, well, you need to take something to suppress your levels. You know, which one is it? You may have your view on that as well. So let me ask Dr. Ali to open the batting for us. With this little introduction, we've been talking about anti-doping. We're talking about whereabouts. We're talking about mistests. And all of this, Dr. Ali, comes in the context of a prohibited list substances that athletes aren't supposed to take all right for us to have a level playing field dr ali could you please um begin the discussion by telling us what is this prohibited list you know who, who comes up with this and exactly what's the criteria that's used to determine whether or not something should be prohibited and of course after that we will uh welcome christoph and jaime to chime in as well dr ali over to you okay let's talk about what criteria is used for this? The criteria that is used for, to design what is prohibited is that one, the substance or drug should have the potential to enhance or it enhances sport performance. Secondly, it represents an actual or potential health risk to athletes. Thirdly, it violates the spirit of sport. Fourthly, if you have a substance or method which masks the effect of detection of one of the prohibited substances, it is all, that substance is also prohibited. So if it's a masking agent and it prevents the laboratory from picking up the substance that is used that is prohibited, that is also prohibited. And also, there is a substance that basically it has not been delegated to any one of the S0 to S9, those are the various substances that are prohibited. It is a new drug on the market. It is under trials. It is used by the vets, and, but it may be a drug that is not used by humans at present. How it gets on the list? From January, WADA has its, its executive committee, gets together with its health, medical, and uh, drug committee this committee basically confers with sporting organizations with a lot of stakeholders throughout the world with drug agencies with intelligence agencies and they come up with a list that they review and in september they put this list together and it's published in october and it will be enacted in the first of january the following year and that prohibited list is reviewed by all, all the national anti-doping organizations have a say, the writers, and we do have a say of what drugs we can put in or what drugs we would like taken out. And there will be a big discussion. And then the, the committees go back to, to the WADA executive committee before this list is put together in September, October, and then it's uh, enacted in January of the following year. 
Dr. Ali, thank you very much for that. I, I want to, to use your opening comments uh, to segue over to uh, the legal minds. Jaime, if I can uh, ask you to, to, to make a comment. Dr. Ali has helped us to understand uh, the, how the prohibited list is put together, the, the, the entire process, and the fact that there's a three-month window, I guess, for people to make themselves familiar. But, 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 but Jaime, it, 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 it brings the question to bear that if one of these substances is found in an athlete's body, all right, in, in, in legal language, this strict liability principle, where it really doesn't matter if there's intention or not, all right, you can suffer a period of ineligibility. Is this, is this fair? All right, is it fair for an athlete to be completely innocent, but to have this prohibited substance in their system? It's not their fault, but then they can suffer um, a period of not being able to compete after working very hard. Is this something that needs to be revisited? Trick question <laughs> in some way, because this is one of the main discussions, uh, legal discussions regarding doping is the strict liability principle. As lawyers, when, when you discuss this uh, doping or the strict liability principle and the doping disciplinary processes to lawyers or attorneys who are not in sports, it's very hard for them to grasp the concept that athletes are presumed responsible of a doping uh, violation and the burden of proof of, of establishing that they are not responsible of an anti-doping regulation is upon the athlete. It's not upon the anti-doping organization to establish the anti-doping uh, violation. Because the, the, the WADA code is filled with what we call in, in law presumptions. There are a lot of presumptions. There, the first presumption is that the collection of samples was done correctly. The other presumption is, uh, or, uh, uh, is that the laboratory guidelines were followed. The other presumption is that the athlete is responsible for whatever they found in their sample. So all those presumptions start to add up. And then when you go to the disciplinary hearing, it's the athlete that has to rebay up. I don't know if in English is the correct word. It's, it's like you have to challenge. The, the, the athlete is the one who has the responsibility to establish that those presumptions are wrong and present proof to discredit those presumptions. But it was not always like that. You know, before the World Anti-Doping Code started or was enacted, and the first, you know, the, 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 the World Anti-Doping Code is pretty young. The first Olympic Games where we had the, the, the WADA Code uh, implemented was the Athens 2004 Olympic Games. So it's actually, we don't only have four, eight, 12, four Olympic Games with the WADA code. It has made a lot of noise, but the thing is that before 2004, we didn't have a world anti-doping code because WADA didn't exist actually uh, until 1990, 19, 2000, around there. But in the 1980s and 1990s, each international federation had different standards in order to prove an anti-doping violation. And when they started to go into the disciplinary hearings, they found out that it was impossible to establish an anti-doping violation if the anti-doping organization had the burden of proof of establishing the violation because they had to prove that the athlete took that substance with the intention of enhancing their performance. So that was a very difficult standard to establish for the anti-doping organization. So in, uh, during the process, the IOC and these different stakeholders in the Olympic movement decided that if they really wanted, wanted to make a stand against doping in sports, the only way was to impose the responsibility upon the athletes and the athletes are responsible for any substance that enters their body. I'm not saying that that's fair. Sometimes that principle leads to unfair results. I myself have defended a lot of athletes for inadvertent doping or doping that they didn't know that they, they, they were taking a substance, for example, meat contamination, for example, or situations where they were mislabeling of the products. So there are a lot of inadvertent doping around sport that the code 
didn't address that those uh, issues before the actual code. Now, every two or three years, maybe four years, we will see the code relax in some matters in order to allow the athlete to have better uh, line of defense and to argue some uh, defenses that they didn't have available before in order to try and make it more fair. But still, we, uh, and I'm finishing up uh, uh, wrapping World Anti-Doping Code and all of the anti-doping regulations that are based upon the World Anti-Doping Code are very strict upon the athlete. And the athlete has, in, in, when you take the balance, all of the burden is put upon the athlete. So um, one of the aspects that I always push for is that if you're going to be strict with the athlete in order to comply with the code and the burden of proof is going to be so high upon the athlete, the burden is also, is also has to be high upon the anti-doping organization to follow procedures. Because I've seen a lot of, a lot of cases where they are very flexible with the anti-doping organization. Ah, they didn't follow this procedure, but it's okay. But they're very strict upon the athlete. So we, we still are on our way to find a proper balance. And this discussion is not closed. The World Anti-Doping Con is still young, only 16 years of, uh, of being imposed. So we're going to stick, keep on learning as long as cases keep on coming. Thank you very much, um, Jaime, just for giving that really, really detailed and very useful context of the um, one, not just the origin of the code, but also just uh, the, the strict challenges that, that, that athletes face. Um, Christoph, it, it, it really opens up the discussion. Sometimes people said, look, you all want to have a level playing field. You see all of this stuff about prohibited lists that Dr. Ali spoke about and all of these, you know, overlapping rights that, that Jaime spoke about. If you want a level playing field, just open the floodgates. Let everybody take drugs. That's another way to have a level playing field. What are your thoughts on that? Is, is, is that, and, and Dr. Ali, I'm gonna throw that question back to you as well, maybe even from a health perspective. For those who say you want a level playing field, then just let everybody take drugs. That way it's right. level. Your thoughts on that, Christoph? Well, I think um, the thing is, right? We need to limit strict liability too as well, right? I mean, strict liability, seems to be unfair to the athletes. And I'm going to be play like a devil's advocate here too. But the absence of the strict liability is equally unfair if you think about it. You know, for example, who are we going to blame? Are we going to blame the coaches? When we blame the coaches or we level the fines against the coaches, that then dismisses the, 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 the um, then the athlete then will be able to get away with, 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 with cheating because we have now shifted the blame to the coaches. So where's the balance? So I think that the absence is also equally unfair. You know, I mean, in terms of also, if you're looking at the athlete too as well, I mean, it's kind of dogmatically punitive. For example, I remember um, this guy, the British skier, I think he, yeah, I think he accidentally inhaled a, a band similar when he was using an American version of, of VIX instead of using, you know, the, the British version and stuff like that too. So, I mean, it is, um, makes victims of athletes but at the same time i think it's also necessary you know it is necessary to maintain that overarching fairness of of of, of competitive sports you know um moving in terms of let's open it up to to, to all to to, to and let and to, to all um to all athletes let's let's just open it up and let everybody use drugs and stuff like that too i mean again being devil advocate for that and not saying at all is recommend that all athletes take the drugs the thing is that fairness, um, health of the athlete, um, spirit or the sport, all those different things, because technology has become so advanced now, um, taking into consideration the health of the athlete, there are drugs that an athlete can take and still maintain his health and are not dangerous to the body. You know, um, I've heard arguments in terms of um, the spirit, the spirit of the sport, and the spirit of the sport, if you allow um, athletes to take take drugs, it 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 it, it demonizes the, the spirit of the sport. But I don't. And I mean, think about it. Is bio, biological manipulation um, would embody the human spirit? I think so. I mean, think about it. I mean, the the, the way that we we reason, the, the way that we we judge stuff like that. For example, classical musicians, um, they commonly use um, I think is um, beta blockers to reduce their stress. 
so that the performance is even better. What, 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 is, what is actually wrong with that in, in terms of a sport? Once it doesn't risk the health of the athlete, I mean, and level, and it will also level the, the, the playing field. For example, genetically, um, Ian Top, they say the reason why he's one of the best swimmers is because of his big feet, you know? Um, so what is wrong with an athlete now leveling the playing field by taking performance drugs to be able to reach to the standard of, a, of a Ian Top swimmer because he doesn't have big feet? You know, so so I think I think there's, there's it's twofold. You you have to do you have to you have to balance it out. Um, in terms of strict liability, you have to coach the. I think what are, what what is too discretionary in, in in my view. You know, in, in some instances, you, you either have to have a balance of the regulations. You have to have a, a certain balance of regulation so that it addresses both fronts. It addresses yes, the onus is on the athlete, but the onus is also on the coaches too as well. You know, balance, balance that. For example, um, I remember the, the East German swim team, um, when they were competing, they were forced to take the drugs. Why are we blaming the athletes? They were forced to take the drugs. And I think they ended up suing the, suing the, 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 the German government. Yeah, you know? Yeah, so, so that, that, is my, that is my position. I mean, the, the main thing is that, yes, it is unfair to athletes, but I think the absence is also equally unfair. Thanks very much, Christoph and uh, Dr. Ali. You 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 you're hearing uh, some the, the 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 legal perspectives, the issues of balancing rights um, are things too onerous towards the athletes. I mean, an athlete is just trying to to to, to excel at their sport. So you bring all of these other obligations, and it becomes a little bit onerous. So this whole idea of you know and let's. Let's, let's bag all of this anti-doping education and let's just open up the floor. Take what you want, all right, and compete. Dr. Ali, especially with your expertise from a sports medicine perspective and just as a, as a medical practitioner, is that something that you would encourage? Everybody take drugs, the playing field is level. I'll play, I'll play lawyer a little bit. You make laws and you make rules to protect the majority, so therefore you will have to penalize the few. I say that in that the health of the majority of the athletes is paramount. You have to remember that we have a society in which a lot of young, talented people come from the lower socioeconomic groups. And you could go back into a type of slavery, sports slavery, where you take these athletes, you dope them, so they excel and give you phenomenal performances. You get your name prominent, you get your, your sponsorship, you get your endorsements, and then the athlete becomes ill and dies. But then you could go on to another athlete because you have choices of people you can use. So when your group like WADA or like any anti-doping organization, one must protect the majority and you're looking to protect the innocent. And a lot of times when we make rules and regulations, we are looking to protect the innocent. It is easy to say that, okay, let's bring in everybody and everybody get COVID. So therefore we are being fair. We are listening to the rights of everybody, but we're not protecting the 1.4 million in Trinidad and Tobago. We have to be very careful when we make decisions about certain things that we basically open, not we don't level the playing field. We open a, a cage, a lion's cage, and basically we endanger the lives of many. And we see young athletes falling dead before us with diseases that we have not seen before. Remember, most of these drugs that enhance performance have severe side effects when taken. And therefore, once you start to dope, there is no controlled doping. People want to be better and better and better. So they take more and more and more. When do you stop? When the athletes fall, fall long dead? When do you stop? Dr. Ali, thank you. you you've, you've raised the question about winning at all costs. And, and, and Jaime, especially with your international experience, it really does bring to mind um, the situations coming out of, of, of Russia. Um, of course, you know, the McLaren report, and you had uh, pretty much confirmation of state-sponsored doping. 
all right? And, and for our listening and viewing audience, the, the, the situation coming out of Russia is that based on a whistleblower, all right, somebody who on the inside uh, who saw what was going on uh, came up and, and, and spoke and said, look, here's what's happening in Russia. The government is behind this. Your Ministry of Sport, your laboratories, your Olympic committees, everybody's behind it. I mean, Jaime, how, how do you even talk about integrity of sport if you have a situation where you have an entire country, all right, an entire country in terms of, of its government, all right, supporting, all right, um, the practice of doping um, and just kind of bring, in, bring into the fore Dr. Ali's point about winning at all costs. I mean, how do you deal with that when you have a situation like, like Russia? Well, that's a good question. And sometimes uh, we in sports in general, we are tend to be a little bit romantic about thinking about that sports is this fairyland where everything is good and beautiful. But sport is run by human beings. And human beings uh, are subject to corruption. In, in wherever you put them, human beings, either in religion, in government, in corporations, in sports, they're going to be people who don't want to follow the rules. So sports is not immune to that. So um, if I, 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 I like to think that I'm in sports because of the ideals of the Olympic movement, which I really believe in them, but I have to be realistic that within the Olympic movement as well, and it's in, in private corporate movements and religious movements and governmental movements and, and even social movements, uh, entities, there are people who don't like to follow the rules and people who want to go by the side and they're not ethical. So um, what happens in Russia and the doping, it's, it's, it's not something new. Um, it, uh, some governments, some doping situations have been state sponsored, like you, the example you put for Russia, but it was state sponsored in East Germany in the 70s. And although in the United States, there has not been a state-sponsored doping program, we do have knowledge that the United States Olympic Committee looked to the other side knowing that a lot of their athletes in the 80s were into doping. And they just looked the other side, to the other side. So the other way. So um, because at least from in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, we, during the Cold War, Sports was the real battlefield. You know, the one side and the other side were, were fighting a war in the sports arena and they do, would do whatever it took in order to win that war. And in, 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 a, in, a, in a country like Russia, for example, winning in sport is part of showing the dominancy of the, of the country. And in a, in a lot of countries, it's like that. Whatever you do in sports, it shows how powerful your country is. So that argument of Dr. Ali about winning of all costs is part of what we have seen in the history of, huma of, of humanity. So if you tell a, a human being, if you take this or if you do that, you're going to be better, you're going to be smarter, you're going to be faster, they will take it. They will do it. Well, if we can go back to, to Eden when, <laughs> when they gave the, the, the apple to, to Adam and Eve. They say, if you eat this, you're going to be smarter. You're going to know everything that they took it. You know, when, when the soldiers were in the war, they would give them drugs in order to be more effective in the war. So they, they will take it. So in that sense, um, I think that I don't support uh, – a, 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 a battlefield, um, a playing field where any, it's up for grabs and anybody can do whatever they want in terms of taking uh, substances. Because like Dr. Ali says, for me, it's the health of the athletes. The health of the athletes should be the first concern. But my big criticism to WADA is that their campaigns are always directed toward cheaters and fair play. And they always direct their campaign saying, Whoever gives an adverse analytical result is a cheater. And that's not true every time. And that's not true every time. There are a lot of people who are being suspended because of violations, which under the rules they should be suspended, but they're not cheaters. 
Sometimes it's they don't know, they, they, they are negligent because they don't, they don't investigate what they're taking. But instead of, of, of doing a campaign of saying that you're a cheater, you're a cheater, you're a cheater, I think that the campaign should, or the money of, the, of those educational campaigns should go through uh, giving the athletes the knowledge to say, this is bad for your health. You can die from this, or you can have serious health complications when you retire. You are giving up years of your life in order for the short time glory of an Olympic Games but you are going to have complications in the future. I think I don't think WADA stresses that enough because they are concentrating on trying to make athletes who are uh, suspended or, are, or that engage in an adverse analytical result as cheaters. And I, I and I think that if you switch that, you if you go through the base of the athletes and the young athlete and saying this is bad for your health and and and, and this is bad for you we can do much better than just saying that you're a cheater because cheaters win. Cheaters win. That's why they cheat because they want to win. So nobody wants to be a loser. So, okay, if, if I have to cheat in order to win an Olympic gold medal, what's the risk? Maybe they, they, they get me, but may, maybe they, they catch me, maybe they don't. Well, Lance Armstrong never gave an, an, an adverse analytical result in his life. If it wasn't for a whistleblower, uh, he, he, he would still have his seven Tour de France titles. So those are the things that we have to think about, in my opinion. I mean, you've raised some really um, thought-provoking uh, concepts there. And even a little while ago, as you mentioned, Lance Armstrong and his seven Tour de France titles. I mean, it really does also bring up uh, the case of, of Marion Jones, who was tested over 150 times and never tested positive. Um, it's only as a result of lying to, I believe it was a, a federal jury that she actually served a, a, a six month suspension. So um, it's, it's really interesting. You can actually have top level athletes who are able to disguise uh, these positive tests. And, you know, one of the things you spoke about are the incentives or the disincentives, you know, for, for cheating. And, and Christoph, I would just want to bring in maybe a Caribbean context here. How much does a Caribbean culture prevent an athlete who might be thinking, boy, boy, a tired coming forth, you know, I want to get on that podium. So I feel I'm going to take something. But you know what? Boy, this Trinidad, you know, this, this Barbados, boy. Boy, I, I, I can't handle that shame. <laughs> you know what I mean? Trinidad and Tobago, boy, this is a, this is a country that is big on Pekong. All right, Jaime, P Pekong is, 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 a, is a form of, of uh, maybe poking fun at you in a very creative way. That's the, that's, that's the language that we use in Trinidad and Tobago. Christoph, that's our culture become a major disincentive for an athlete who might be tempted to cheat. I'm just thinking, boy, as somebody said before, boy, I had a walk down Frederick Street. Yes, I want nobody pointing fingers yeah. at me. How yeah, much of a factor is, 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 is the I, culture? I think it's, a, it's a, actually it's a very huge factor, actually, too, because as you well know, I mean, Trinidad society is very, is very small. I mean, we all know each other, you know? So I think that acts also as a deterrent you know, in terms of impropriety, in terms of taking drugs and stuff like that too as well. Because I mean, you put the next door, but say, well, that man on drugs, boy, wow. You know, that, 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 you know, that kind of thing. So, so, and plus our families are very intertwined too as well. So, you know, so, you're, so when you see an athlete taking drugs, you can't walk down, like I said, Frederick Street and then, but wait, that man on drugs, boy. And then Trinidadians love to label. So culture is a big part of, a big part of it too, as a dis disincentive, you know? We label you. And once we label you as a, 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 a so-called cheater or, or someone who used drugs, that's it. And then it affects also your sponsorships because um, endorsement contracts too as well. You know, it's a very small pool. So for example, we'll have, I don't want to call any names of any companies, but we have a lot of companies who sponsor athletes. Once you get labeled as a cheat, that then now deminimizes and your, 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 your opportunity to earn too as well, outside of just running sport. So I think our culture, um, because of the size, is, our, is, is, is phenomenal in terms of our deterrent. Thanks very much for those perspectives, uh, Christoph. Um, and uh, you know, it, it goes back to one of the points Jaime was making about sometimes the, the regulators are, are too quick to label somebody as a cheat when look, they, they may have just really innocently ingested something there's so many cases where you, you look and you realize 
there's absolutely no intention to cheat here, but maybe there was a little bit of, of carelessness. But I want to pick you up on the point of labeling. And again, for our uh, listening and, 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 and viewing audience, if you do have questions, please uh, send them in on the on the, the, the chat. Uh, Ms. Cox is going to um, let us know, and we're going to get to those questions and comments in a short while. So we're able to, to really try and uh, as best as possible address some of the concerns that you may have. But you spoke about labeling. And allow me, gentlemen, to, to go backwards um, a little bit. This idea of labeling, I want to go back to Casta Semenya. And, and, and Dr. Ali, I, I want to start with you because you might be able to just kind of shed some, some light for us. The International Association of Athletics Federations, well, now rebranded as World Athletics, all right, they were able to convince the Court of Arbitration for Sport that their regulations, the difference of sex development regulations, they were necessary and proportionate. Coming back to this issue of level playing field, they said, Casta Semenya, your levels of testosterone make you biologically a man. So we are not disputing your legal recognition as a woman or the fact that you have identified yourself as a woman, but you need to suppress those levels. Because when you run against other women, it is really as though a man is competing against women. That's what they were saying. And the Court of Arbitration for Sport was sufficiently convinced, convinced by the evidence. Dr. Ali, did the Court of Arbitration for Sport open up a can of worms by saying, look, for the sake of a level playing field, we will mandate female athletes to take medication so that it could be under five nanomoles per liter, all right, so that they could compete as women. Are we going down a slippery slope when we have decisions like that, or was the Court of Arbitration for Sport fair and balanced? And of course, we'd want to be able to get Christophe's and, um, and Jaime's perspectives on that, but Dr. Ali, especially from a medical perspective. There's a bit of a dichotomy here. The problem here basically is that Semenya basically is a physiologically male, living in a female physical body and socially and psychologically she is female. But the problem is that uh, physiologically she is male because she has testes that is producing androgens. The level of androgens, when you take the highest level, the maximum level that you will tolerate in a female athlete, her level of androgens is way above that. She's a hyperandrogenism, and this is extra secretion of androgens. And because of that, if she's going to compete with a worldwide group of women who have uh, androgens way below her, an androgen basically is a significant enhancement for powers, for muscle power and so on. So therefore it is used as a doping agent to enhance muscle power and strength and anaerobic type activities. So therefore she is much stronger than most of her female contemporaries. And because of this, you, if she's going to stay on the sporting world, I believe that medical people within Cast and within the, the anti-doping organization, WADA would have come up with and said, okay, if you're going to compete and you're going to compete on this, we want this playing field to be level. The only way that we can make it fair and fair competition for other females is that you bring down your androgenic levels or you stop competing. I, situation, thanks so much for that, Dr. Ali. I mean, situations like that, Jaime and, and, and Christoph, really make sports lawyers like you guys chomp at the bits, eh? <laughs> because, I mean, look, th 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 this, this judgment from the Court of Arbitration for Sport is over 160 pages long. It's, it's just a lot of intense evidence. But Jaime and, 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 and Christoph, what about just basic human rights? And, and, and what about maybe from a discrimination point of view? Because one of the arguments raised would have been but you don't have the same regulations for men. So why it is you targeting women? And then of course, there's a very delicate issue because you had this with, with um, Duty Chan from India and then you had Semenya from South Africa. People said, look, man, boy, we, we seem to have a target. We seem to have even a bit of racial discrimination here as well too. 
all right? People have said, and you, you mentioned Ian Top a little while ago, um, Christoph. People have said, well, look, Bolt has these extra long legs and, you know, he, he could make the 100 meters and how many strides. You know, um, Michael Phelps has particular, you know, things about his biology that allows him to be able to, uh, to excel in the pool. You haven't asked them to suppress anything. So why have you targeted Semenya and Chand? So it just seems to be discriminatory, seems to be a breach of human rights. Um, Jaime, your thoughts, Christoph, your thoughts after? Um, I have a very particular approach and opinion of the Caster Semenya case. Um, because the thing is that human beings, we human beings are obsessed with classification. We classify everything. So it's very hard for us to classify something that doesn't fit perfectly in one of the boxes that we have created. So although I, I, I of course, I, I, I defer to, to, the, to Dr. Ali's uh, comments on, on the medical side, the thing is that even Castor Semenya testosterone levels are not high enough to be competing with men. So even, even though she has high testosterone level that is produced endogenously, she doesn't produce enough testosterone to equiparate or to, to equal it or, uh, as for, uh, uh, as, uh, for men and athletes. So actually, she's a female. She's registered as female. She considers her a female. She was raised as a female. She was actually classified as a female because our binary sex classification determine sex upon visual confirmation of testes. So when, when, the, when, the, when the baby is born and the doctor looks, okay, it has testes, yes, man. If it doesn't have testes, no, women. So she was classified as a woman, but now because her body produces a hormone that is higher what other women produce, then you cannot be a woman for sports but she doesn't have enough testosterone in order to compete equally with men either. So where, we do, where do we put Castor Semenya? Where do we put Dodi Chan? So that provokes, started to think that the World Athletics regulations and the confirmation by, by, by the cast is establishing that in order to compete with women, it is irrelevant whether you have testes or not. What is important is your testosterone level. So what if I have testes and I undergo a suppression and I'm a transgender athlete and then I undergo my sex reclassification and I suppress my testosterone levels in order to be under five nano, uh, nanometers. Um, I don't know, it's five nanometers by, by mole. I don't know the, the nanomoles by meter. I don't know the, the terms. But under the threshold that World Athletics has established, then should I be able to compete with women? Because the World Athletic already says that the that the that the criteria to compete with women actually doesn't it's 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 irrelevant what, if you have testes or not. The important thing is that your testosterone level is below this threshold. So they change the criteria. Is so that's. The, the difficult thing I have with the Castor Semenya case, uh, she has appealed to the Swiss Supreme Court in human rights grounds. Uh, from, from the Court of Arbitration of, uh, for Sport, you cannot appeal everything to the Swiss uh, Federal Court. You can only appeal in very particularly particular arguments, and one of them is public order and human rights. And even if she doesn't uh, win in, at the Swiss uh, Federal Court, she still can go to the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice because World Athletics is based in Luxembourg. In Luxembourg is part of the European Union. World Athletic is not in Switzerland. Switzerland is not part of the European Union. So in terms of politics and law, she still has some resources within the European Union to challenge the case. So in order to wrap it up, the Kester Semenya case opens a can of worms, yes not only because of the particular case of Castor Semenya, because we have established a new criteria in order to compete in the women's classification, and we have opened a door 
in regard to transgender athletes, which is not a doping issue. Castor Semenya is not a transgender athlete, but it opens up the discussion for transgender athletes to try to compete as women, men, transgender women, which are men who trans transpose to women, to compete with women as long as they have enough, uh, they don't have the, the, the they, they don't meet the threshold of testosterone. So it's up for grabs right now. We are we are navigating in uncharted waters right now. So we have to see what happens. I mean, thanks so much for those uh, for those comments. Um, Christoph, I mean, so many issues raised with so many. It's it's scientific, it's legal, it's it's ethical, it's human rights. I, 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 and, I, and, and with so many, it's, it's, it's human rights to me. This is a human rights issue for me. You know, um, you are now trying to tell someone that they cannot compete, which is a right in itself. What about my right to compete? What about my right to compete, which overall WADA is saying the overarching principle is one, fairness, health of the athlete, and your right to compete. They have now said that because you have a certain elevated testosterone level, which matter-of-factly is something genetically normal, but just abnormal in terms of um, particular individuals or human beings, you are now telling them that you cannot compete because uh, you have a certain level of testosterone. That is a human rights issue in itself. So it's going to be very interesting to see that even if she loses at cast, that she may very well have a hearing and win going to the human rights body, the human rights body. You know, so it's very interesting to see. But to me, it's, it's, it's more of a human rights issue. Thanks, Christoph. And for our uh, viewers, you may have heard the panelists referring to, to, to CAS. CAS, that's the, the Court of Arbitration for Sport. This is pretty much your, your, your highest sports court globally. Um, and, and pretty much there's, they've built up over more than 30 years of, of experience in, in dealing with sports-related matters. So you find uh, the top-level athletes, they, they go to CAS um, all right, to be able to, uh, to have uh, their cases heard. Um, Jaime would have mentioned that in, on very limited grounds, there may be a further appeal uh, to the Swiss uh, Federal Court. Um, I'm going to hand over uh, to Rahima in a short while, but uh, Dr. Ali, uh, I'll just have you close this part of your discussion before we start taking in uh, some questions and comments from the panel. And just going back to Semenya, um, and we, with my non-medical um, understanding, it seems as though Semenya had XY chromosomes. And my understanding was that as soon as women have XX and men have XY, so once you see XY, you are automatically outside of the female category. And Jaime made the point that, you know, the whole idea of classification, we want to, to have this binary male and female, but Semenya has raised the possibility, okay, well, is there a, is there a third category? I'm just gonna help us to understand it before we start taking some comments. She has XY chromosomes. What does that mean? <laughs> XY basically is uh, the chromosomal makeup of, of the male species. You carry your X chromosome and the Y chromosome. So XY is a typical male. And once you see an XX, that is typically female. So the females tend to have the two X. The thing that gets you with the Semenya is that socially, psychologically, she was grown up and physically as a female. And this has a great amount of saying to the entire public and to the entire world. And like Yame said, we want to categorize things to fall in because that's how we understand. We can't understand things that fall outside of the ordinary. It must be in a category, it must be in a box. Semenya makes us think outside the box and it brings in an empathy and an understanding that organizations must be willing to go. Is she being fair? Is she a cheat? She's not. And we have to be very careful when organizations take people's lives and put it asunder, break it up, because we want to believe in a category we have made and we cannot understand outside of that category. And that, and that is hurtful to the athletes. 
this is it's so 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 true what you're saying um the Semenya case has had so many levels of complexities and i mean even even the 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 caste tribunal really had to wrestle um because you know in in, in concluding the, ju the judgment they said you know something a couple of things confuse us well number one you know one of the things that came up in the judgment is that there were some other events like i, I believe paul vault and some others where they, 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 some of the same advantages that Semenya would have had apply to those events, but there were no regulations applying to those events. So that raised some question marks. All right. How come 400 meters, 800 meters, 1500 meters, one mile? Is it just coincidence that those are the events that Semenya runs in? That was, that's a question that was raised. And then the Court of Arbitration for Sport also said, I could understand why you have the regulations for the 400 and the 800, but how it is you come up with this for the 1500 and the one mile? So even though they <laughs> allowed the regulations to go through, they still had some doubts. So it seems as though this matter is far from finished. And even as Jaime reminded us, there seem to be some other avenues that Semenya, I think she's going to go the full distance, no pun intended, <laughs> as a middle distance runner, I think she's going to go the full distance in terms of, and, and maybe for her, she may just want to make a point. I know she signed a contract to play football in South Africa. She says, I am, you're not getting me to take any medication, so I'm going to play a different sport. So it really seems to have quite a way to go. Um, to Ms. add to that, Tyron, sorry. To, uh, add yes, to, that, to add to that is that she is running aerobic events. Anabols help you with anaerobic events, power events. She is running the middle distance. And when you look at that and you take everything into consideration, I think that WADA should have been able to say, look, let's drop this case against this lady. And that is what it, that's where it should have gone. Yes. And, and let me just make the, the distinction, even though um, anti-doping did come up, the, 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 the genesis of the defense really is coming not from WADA, but it's from, the, um, from World Athletics, uh, even though there was an, an, an element of anti-doping discussed uh, in it. A really, really useful comments. Uh, Rahima, I um, want to be able to hand over uh, to you uh, so that we can take questions or comments that have been coming uh, from our audience. Um, Rahima, over to you. Hello, good evening to all. I have three questions. The first is directed to Dr. Terry Ali, and it's from Grace Jackson. She asks, what if they were to decide to have a borderline that would allow you the athlete and if they could go over that amount they are penalized example like they do with drunk driving could that be controlled but, but there's certain there's certain substances in which they ha there's a threshold and even like the the beta 2 agonist there is a threshold that you take for asthma as you take an inhaler so there is a threshold and it all depends on the level you take. Like uh, if you take too much pseudoephedrine, you can test positive because you go over the 150 micrograms per mil in your urine. So therefore you have to be careful. If you take three tablets and any one of the drugs that has the D, but basically if you take three of those tablets, you will be test positive. So yes, there are thresholds and there are levels and they use this for certain substances. So there are certain substances that do have threshold, but there are certain substances that if they even present in the urine or in the blood, you are tested positive. And Grace, I totally agree with you where certain substances in certain cases, if you can actually go to threshold levels for almost all of the drugs, it will be a fairer playing field. Thank you, Dr. Ali. The next question is directed to Christoph Bratwit, and it's from Anthony Creed. And he asks, five years have elapsed since Parliament has passed an enacted legislation for the Trinidad and Tobago Anti-Doping Commission. What is the status of this commission after five years? Yes, that, that question was uh, directed to Christoph Raffet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you need Ms. Cox to repeat the question? Yes, please. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
The question is from Anthony Creed, and he asked five years have elapsed since Parliament has passed and enacted legislation for the Trinidad and Tobago Anti-Doping Commission. What is the status of this commission after five years? Right. Right. Um, good question, Anthony. Um, this is more of a, a political question than, 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 a, than a sport question. Um, so because it has lapsed, it's going to have to restart. And depending on, on government legislature and, and their provisions, for example, it's going to take the route of a normal government bill. So you're going to have the, have the white paper, you're going to have to have the green paper, and it's, and it's basically a, a, a government, um, in, but it's basically government in charge of bringing back to life this, this particular piece of le legislation or, or the commission. And if, if Rima, just before you go to the, the next question, I'll, I'll just um, quickly add, it, it, it really is a, a useful question that uh, Mr. Creed has, 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 has put on the table because I mean, the, the legislation was initially passed since, since 2013, then got you know presidential assent in 2015. And, and really and truly all that needs to happen is that the anti-doping board has to be appointed. So we have a situation where this legislation has been passed um, as, 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 as Christoph was, was indicating, and it, um, it really is out of the hands of, of the sports movement. It really has to be driven um, by, by the Ministry of Sport. Um, the, the useful thing about the composition of the anti-doping board is that different professional bodies all right, would have recommended people to sit on the board. So it was, was really good from the viewpoint of it was not political appointments. You had the, you know, um, NADAP making a, a, a recommendation. You had the Olympic Committee making a recommendation. You had different professional bodies, the Law Association making a recommendation. You had the, you know, the, 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 the sports medicine people making a recommendation. So it really is an opportunity, but it has to be driven uh, by, by the Ministry of Sports. So um, any, any, any former colleagues out there, there's a little pressure uh, being put on the Ministry to, um, to see that go forward. Yes? Thanks, Rima. Back over to you. Thank you. And this question is directed to Jaime Lamboy, and it's from Chad Maraj. He asks, not all persons will choose the unethical side. Shouldn't we choose to protect those who choose to do the right thing? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that premise. Uh, but the right, the right thing is circumstantial. Well, what is right and what is wrong depends on, on a lot of circumstances. What, what, what is right nowadays or what is wrong nowadays was different 100 years ago. So ethics, I, I don't like, I don't like the, the ethical issue angle in terms of doping. I prefer the health one because like I said, what I has uh, overplayed the ethical card, and that has meant the uh, for every athlete who has engaged in an anti-doping evaluation to be a cheater. And I don't think that well, experience has shown us that that has not been enough. You know, people keep doping, people keep doing it, keep people still saying, "I'm able to take the risk of cheating." in order to have the glory. I, I remember a, 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 an advertising in the 80s, uh, I, maybe some, some of you will remember, at least it was in, uh, I don't live in the States, but I saw it in the States that it says, it, it, they would put a pan in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, 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 a frying pan and they say, this is your brain. And then they would put an egg and a frying egg in the pan. And this is, this is your brain on drugs. So that was, that was dramatic for me. I say, my, my brain will, will fry. So I don't think athletes are completely aware of how these substances actually affect their health. I would, I would agree with the, with the comment of the, of the viewer saying that I would prefer for people doing the right thing always. But if you go back, that's not the experience that we have with human beings. They don't, they don't choose the right things always. So we must find another angle in order, in order to make them understand that taking these substances are not good for them, not only because it's against the ethical standards of fair play, but particularly because it's bad for their health. And in order to get to that podium and get those substances in their body, they will suffer the consequences after they retire. And I think that would be more dramatic 
for the athletes to understand, particularly young ones who are maybe impressed with graphical representation, just like the ones I just explained, and play the ethic card, ethical cards alongside with the health one, not the other way around. I have a few more questions just, that just came in. Um, and the first is from Ian Trinidad, and this is directed to both um, Christoph Brathwaite and Jaime Lamboy. And he asks, is it fair to ban all athletes in a relay team because one has tested positive for drugs? Christoph, would you like to take that first? Sure, the question sure, was, sure. I, yeah. Yeah. if yeah. one is positive. Um, it, is my, it is my opinion, and I, 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 I say this is my opinion, because you remember the nature of a relay race. You can't run a relay by yourself. That's basically it. So logically speaking and rationally speaking, and it's reasonable to, 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 to say that all should be banned. Because if you give different lengths, if a person is... is is enhanced and he runs his his leg faster than anybody else then you get a clear advantage and that is and, and, that, and that is what happened so in a relay basically it's a team sport so if one has an advantage and he hands off the button five seconds or three seconds faster than the other person the likelihood of that person who has the advantage winning is greater so in the end, it is my, my opinion that yes, in a nutshell, yes, all should, all should be banned. I, 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 I tend to agree with my colleague here. Um, remember that the, if, if one of the members of the relay it has an adverse analytical re, uh, result. The, the result of that relay is taken out, but the other three are not suspended because, because they, 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 didn't, they didn't engage in an anti-doping uh, violation, right? Of course, they, they, the result is taken out because in the relay, there's no way. You, 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 it's, it's a team. If it's all part of a, a concerted effort. It's different, for example, in a basketball team. You have 12. It's much more difficult if you have one, uh, an adverse analytical result of one player, you cannot actually say that because of that one player, the whole team won, you know, because basketball has a much, a lot of more variables, same as volleyball, for example, a lot of variables in a basketball game or in a volleyball game than in a relay. In a relay, it's all interconnected. If one messes, messes it up, it's, the relay is gone. So I know it's hard, but, I don't see any other way of, 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 of handling an anti-doping uh, violation from one member of the relay and, and not uh, uh, dis, uh, disqualify, make a, uh, take out the result from the, uh, from, from the whole team. Uh, it's like, for example, it happens, just take it, just take it in another example. Let's say it's not an anti-doping violation. Let's say, for example, if a false start, I was in the, in the Rio Olympic games in the finals of the four, I think it was the 200 or the 400 relay, and the Dominican Republic team had a false start. They were disqualified, the whole team. They didn't even run. So, and you say, is, that's not fair. Well, they're disqualified, but if they, if they start the race and one of them invades the, 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 the how do you say, oh, how do you say how to say it in English, the track, the, the lane, the lane of, the, of, of another team, they are disqualified also. And it, be, it was just because of one athlete that they disqualified the whole team. So in that sense, I think that the regulation is pretty consistent in a relay. For the fault of one athlete, the whole team is disqualified for the result. But only the athlete that engaged in the anti-doping regulation will be suspended. Okay, I have um, one last question. Um, from Chad Mirage, and he asks, how are all the other female athletes who work just as hard their, ent their entire lives, sorry, cope with that? That is Miss um, Simeo competing against women with normal testosterone levels. 
And was that question directed to anybody in particular on the panel? No, it wasn't. So it's an open question. Anyone can take it if they like. Raymond, let me just ask you to repeat it for the benefit of all of the panelists in case anyone wants to jump in first. Sure, not a problem. The question is from Chad Mirage, and he asked, how are all the other female athletes who work just as hard their entire lives cope with that, that they will never be able to win against Miss Simania? And he also asked as well, Miss Simania competing against women with normal testosterone levels, where she wins every time. What is the competition in, sorry, where is the competition in sport? I have something to say, if you allow me. I, 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 I disagree with the premise. Caster Semenya doesn't win every time. So that's, that, that the premise, it's, 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 uh, it's not correct. Uh, she's very highly competitive. She has won a lot of times, but she has not won every race she has ever ran against women. She has lost races. She has been first. She has been second. She has been fourth. Yes. Her testosterone or leverage put her, puts her in a, in, a, in a situation of advantage, uh, definitely, but she still has to train. She still has to go to the, her workout. It's not like because of the fact that she has higher, because she has higher testosterone leverage than women, but not as high as men. So that's true that she may have higher testosterone level than women, but she still has to go to train. She has to go to the gym. She has to go to the, to the track and train every day and, and eat well in order to be able to compete, not just because she has high testosterone or higher testosterone level means that she's gonna be running like the wind. Um, but at the same time, is you're gonna say, well, so the answer is not let her compete at all. You know, hyperandrogenism is, and the doctor can correct me here, with all these scientific advances, it's more common than you think particularly in Southeast, in India and African countries, there are more hyperandrogenic women than we think they are. Maybe not all of them are in sports, but hyperandrogenism is not that uncommon on the world. So some people I have read is maybe this is far-fetched, but some people may be saying, this might be some genetical virus, virus in, 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 the human, in human beings that we, in, in, in the next 10, 20, 30 years, we might see it more often in, in, in women that we see it today and definitely more often than we saw it in the beginning of the 20th century. Thank you very much, Jaime. Dr. Ali, your comments on that? Yeah, there are some geographical differences. And, and the comment I have to say is that one must remember that doping in sport makes a slight difference only with everything else being equal. That all the athletes have to be training hard in the gyms, in the, you know, discipline, in their training, their nutrition and everything has to be up to standard. It is not that somebody is a poor trainer, he does not turn up, does not eat well, and just take some drugs and come and do well. That does not happen. It, the, all the athletes are on par. They are training hard, and the drug or the high test, the slightly elevated testosterone level will make that slight difference. But remember that she is running middle distance. In middle distance running, you know, a lot of this power is negated. Most of this power is used in shorter distances. So, you know, one has to be very careful as we judge along the way. And I think WADA. And uh, a lot of the people, the scientists, are now rethinking the ideas. I think Simenia is a great case. It's a great case to study. And it will make a difference going, moving forward with a lot of the athletes. Thanks, Dr. Ali. Christoph, final word to yeah. you as we wrap up. And I'm going to pass the battle. Um, right. What yeah. uh, uh, Ian to close us off. Christoph, final word to you. Um, yeah, sure. Um, and, this is, and this is the thing. Um, the, 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 que the question is, is as, as, as Jaime was saying, is, 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 is kind of imbalanced too, because to a higher testosterone level doesn't make you a complete athlete. There are other characteristics that make you a complete athlete. And as the good doctor said, training, et cetera. 
also mental capacity, strategy. All these different things make you the better athlete. So there's no imbalance for the other female athlete. What if someone, what, what if um, Simena didn't train or, 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 or had, a, had a bad day and, and, and she's not mentally prepared for the race? She may fail the race. She may not win. But another athlete with the lower testosterone level has the correct strategy, has the correct timing, and has the mental capacity to, to, uh, um, to, to, to win this race, will win. So there's, no, so there's no real imbalance. Thanks very much, Christoph, for those comments. And thanks uh, to the viewing audience for sending in your questions um, and for your participation. Uh, this is where we bring a close towards um, of our overlap of science and law, um, infiltrating the sports industry. And I know for the, for, the, for the pure sports persons out there, it's like, just keep the lawyers out, keep the scientists out. Let's just do our thing. No, I think Dr. Ali, I think they're more friendly and they're more welcoming of the scientists, not so much the lawyers. But we've kind of found a way <laughs> to try and make ourselves relevant. But let me say thanks to each of you. We really do appreciate um, what you've brought to the table, your experience, uh, your investment um, in sport. Uh, whether through the law or whether through science um, and just the perspectives that you would have brought to the benefit um, of our audience tonight. So thanks very much uh, to everyone. I'm going to hand over uh, to Ian Pritchard, who's going to give um, our final words and probably give some comments about the upcoming um, webinar next week. So everyone, please be safe. Take good care of yourself. I hand over to Ian at this time. Thank you very much, Tyrone. And allow me to say thanks to our distinguished panel. Um, Christoph, thank you very much for gracing us with your presence. Jaime, all the way from Puerto Rico, welcome and thank you very much. And Dr. Ali, of course, as per usual, your experience and knowledge in the sport industry in terms of drugs and law, where sport is concerned, has been tremendous and your education tonight has brought us to a point of greater knowledge in that regard. I want to thank all the participants who tuned in on the YouTube platform. Thank you for joining with us this evening. This was very interesting. And to our moderator, Tyrone, excellent as usual. Thank you, UTT has been very gracious. And we thank you very much for gracing us with your presence and sharing with us your wide knowledge in terms of sport law. To the participants, please sign on next week. It's going to be hot. Our final session of our five-part series, Gender Equality in Sports. We have been accused, and rightly so, of having mostly male representation on our panels. Today, we had a full male panel. Last time, and we have been told, it seems that we are having women as tokens on our panel discussions. Next week, it's going to be fiery. The women are going to be out in their large numbers. Our panelists include Bridget Adams, Hall of Famer and Caribbean netball captain. We also have Miss Alina Edwards, 12-time national table tennis champion. Miss Rhea Ramnarine, top boxer in Trinidad and Tobago. We'll also have with us our Jamaican friend, my good friend of Jamaica, Grace Jackson will be joining us as the, on the panel as well next week. And it will be moderated by none other than West Indian cricketer, Stacey Ann King. We also have token, two male token <laughs> panelists <laughs> next week. <laughs> and they are none other than the President of the Trinidad and Tobago Olympic Committee, Mr. Brian Lewis, who's an advocate for gender equality, and Mr. Imran Jan, who is the assistant coach of the TKR, and also a past West Indian youth player and Trinidad and Tobago national player. So it is going to be hot. How are those two men going to fare with that panel of women and that moderator who is independent? who is knowledgeable about women in sport, all these women who have pushed through, pushed through to ensure that women have their rightful place in sport. So you don't want to miss it. Tune in next week, Thursday, our final
panel discussion, gender equality in sport. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. May God continue to bless us all. Thank you very much, Ian. Okay, Thank you. bye. Thanks a lot. Yami. Yeah. Yami. Yeah. Christoph. Yeah, keep it good. Good night. Tyron. Good night. Take care, Dr. Ali. Keep safe. Yeah.